Hello, everyone. Again, welcome to another edition of the COVID Calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle, and this is my Instagram Live. Um, tonight, I have an amazing guest with me tonight. His name is Raul Rai, and he is an actor based in Los Angeles, California. And uh, look, this man is a genius. Um, there's no way of describing him in any words. You just have to go to his Instagram and his TikTok account um, because he will breathe life into you on a daily basis. And actually, I've never met Raul and um, we're, we don't know each other. And this is actually the first time we're chatting. But I, I want to say that I found his Instagram uh, account and started watching all of the content that he was creating amongst this kind of crisis that we're all in. And it saved my life. Like this man is, uh, is a comedic genius in my, in my mind. And, uh, and he is just amazing. So I look forward to his posts every day. And he's someone who's kept me afloat uh, during my quarantine here in Istanbul. So look, I want to learn about this man. I want to learn about his acting career. I want to learn about what motivates him on a daily basis. I want to know where he's from. I want to know what he studied in university. Uh, and when he decided to go completely insane on social media. So let's all get into this right now. And I am bringing in Raul as we speak. And here we go. <clears throat> All right, Raul, how you doing, buddy? Good, how are you? I'm very well, I'm very well. Thank you so much for making time for me today. Oh no, thank you for having me. Yeah, because uh, look, I mean, I, I feel like I should be thanking you for putting such hilarity into the universe because you're putting out some great karma. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. I, I was listening to the intro, so that was very, that was very touching. No appreciate worries. it. No worries. So look, um, I'm not going to try to describe who you are or what you do because anyone who wants to know needs, needs to just go to your Instagram and your TikTok yeah. account, which is the real Raul Rai. Yes. Okay, great. And I've pronounced that correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're an actor. And, yeah. But, but you've also been quarantined like everyone else and self-quarantining and stuck indoors and you have basically just been creating content and mimicking content and yes. just being as creative as possible during the lockdown yeah it's not good for me to not do anything like it's not good for me to be idle it's yes. just not good because I have a lot of uh, natural energy like even as a kid I had a lot of energy and right. my mom would just like push me into classes, put yep. that energy towards something that's creative, that's that's productive. So I guess from an early age, like having time off is a very kind of weird thing for me because it's it's just not good for me. It's not good for it's not good for my psyche if I like have too much time off and I'm if I'm not being productive in some way. Okay. So good to know. So Let's take it back a little bit because no. it, it's not worth kind of talking about what you're doing now because there are no words to describe it. <laughs> where, 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 you know, it's so funny. You call me a comedic genius. And my brother always thought he was the funny, the, the funny one in the family. Oh, okay. And That's so interesting. I hope he's not watching this and thinking, where did this title come from? Because this kid is not funny. No. Is he, is he older or younger? He's older. I, I'm the youngest, actually. So I have an older brother and an older sister. Okay. So my brother, my, my sister is like the super ambitious one, super yep. smart, very smart, very athletic. My brother is the funny guy. Yeah. Okay. And I'm like this, this happy accident that wasn't supposed to be here, but now I'm here and it's like, okay, let's just deal with this. And as the youngest sibling, you had to fight for attention. And you had to well, create, and you had to create an yeah. audience for yourself. Here's the thing that's so interesting because there's quite a big age gap between myself and my siblings. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, uh, they were like in high school, going to college, and I was, I was the you know 
so I was the only one with my with my parents. So I I got a lot of attention. Oh, okay, so you're like an uh, only child almost. Yeah, in yeah. a way. So I think that's what creates this weirdness. <laughs> the only the the, the quasi semi only child. Okay, that's child. interesting. So so where so where were you born? Are you were you born in the United States? I was. I was born in New York. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. And what did you get up to when you were a kid? Did you have any sporting endeavors or were you interested in acting yes. from a very early age? So acting didn't start until like 18 probably. But as a kid, again, my mom would put me in a lot of classes. So martial arts, tennis, swimming, soccer. She basically put me in everything and saw kind of see what like would stick. Right. So the, the stuff that I stuck with was martial arts. Okay and tennis and swimming. And then eventually when I was 13 ish, I discovered dance. So from 13 onwards, uh, dance became a big part of my life. Okay. That's amazing. And, and I also recognize that you've done some theater as well. When did that, when did that kick in? Yeah. So acting started for me at 18. So I probably started doing theater like, after graduating college, that's when I started pursuing acting uh, full on and, okay. and full time and going aggressively, ambitiously into it. So from there, just doing anything I could get, plays, uh, short films, student films, commercials, whatever it was, I, I would do. Okay. Um, so you're in high school. Your mom is throwing mm -hmm. you into every single sporting event she can find just to burn off some of this energy that we've all been yeah. witness to over the last few months yes. and, and, uh, and how successful was she? Were you getting I would say, I would say a lot of the skills that I now leverage into my TikToks or social media or even acting, like I'm a very physical person. And I think that happens because like of all those classes and my mom, like day in, day out or week in, week out taking me. Cause I like, I think as a kid, like I can't take myself to classes. So the consistency kind of falls on the, on the responsibility, on the shoulders of parents to like right. take their kids to the class. And if the parents don't show up then the kids don't show up because the kids have no other way of getting to class. Mm. So it's, it's a, you know, because of her discipline, I then have discipline to then, you know, keep practicing these things that, in the beginning, she forced me to do, but now I'm extremely grateful because the skills, the mindset that comes from playing sports and martial arts, especially dance, the self-discipline, self-awareness, discipline, humility, all that stuff that I'm now leveraging is really thanks to my mom and my dad. That's amazing. So I, I had a sporting career as well. I played Division One basketball. And there you uh, go. Yeah, I played on two teams, morning practices, evening practices. My mom was driving me all over the place all the time, putting in so much yeah. effort. And uh, yeah, it wow. does. It sticks with you, man. It sticks with you oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it has residual compound effects that, that you know, either you're aware of them or you're not, but it's there. Okay. So um, you graduate university. You're doing a lot of sports. Did you perceive, like, did you pursue a sporting uh, career in university or did you just no. let it go? No, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, sports always for me was like secondary. Like I played tennis aggressively. Um, I played on, bar uh, I was like the captain of my varsity team in high school. But I never had the ambition to pursue it in college. Um, I was like, I was going to go to NYU and uh, pursue dentistry. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> I know it's weird. Uh, but, uh, but I did a film when I was 18, <clears throat> I got cast in a film, which happened through dance. Um, cause I got discovered, I suppose. And, um, and so that kind of changed things for me a lot. So I ended up going to Pace university to join the acting program after doing this film, join the acting program didn't really like fit in I felt and uh I actually found a great teacher outside of school so basically what I did I went to Pace University to study acting dropped out of acting studied economics yep so I graduated an economics degree which is very useful <laughs> very. and 
I uh, studied acting privately with a coach those three and a half years, basically. And then after that, just pursued acting. The, the goal after I did that film, the goal was to be pursue acting full on. And how soul destroying was it to study economics in university? It was my choice. So I, I actually loved it because economics, okay. Pace has a great economics program and a lot of passionate teachers. And the thing about economics, it kind of fits my, I don't know, my, how I understand things. It's, it, there, there's an art to it. There's a science to it. And uh, it's a very people oriented, like you have to become a great observer if you want to be a great e economist. I think you have to listen and observe to people and the world around you. And even though it's the way you're receiving that listening is through the through charts or graphs and numbers, there's 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 a language to it that's very interesting, and 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 it's also made me more worldly. That's when I started understanding like how important, under, like learning about current affairs and and understanding like current events and politics and like the central bank and like there's this giant world, you know, right. there's this real world that I have to start learning about. And I think economics was really my first springboard into that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh. I, had a, I had a different experience. I played um, <laughs> Division One basketball and just kind of took uh, some politics classes and some international politics classes. But I was so focused on basketball that I had no other interests yeah. when I was at, because I was too tired. Like I was training yeah. like four or five hours a day. And then yeah. when I didn't get to go pro, because uh, I wasn't good enough, I went to China and just started traveling the world. Oh. And now before COVID, I was traveling 300 days a year, making film and television all around the world. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah. I live in Dubai um, and I use okay. that as my hub for traveling, but I, you might not know this. So I was actually in Ethiopia trekking yeah. in the Simeon mountains wow. next to the border of South Sudan. And we'd been offline for three days. We got to the top of this high pass about uh, 4,000 meters, about 15, 16,000 feet got up, turned on our phones for the first time, and like the whole world had closed. Like the USA yeah. oh, closed, wow. closing flights, and then uh, the UAE, where I live in Dubai, uh, closed their borders, and I couldn't get home. And one of the only places that was open to me uh, was to come to Istanbul, Turkey, which is where I am now, and I've been here eight weeks. Jesus. <laughs> so I started these COVID calls on my Instagram live uh, to basically yeah. cheer myself up every day. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not half as talented as you are, uh, but <laughs> I want to be able to chat with talented and creative people and get to learn something about them. Yeah. Do you do like podcasts and stuff? Yeah, I do podcasts. Um, Amazing. Um, but uh, these calls, I do like two of them a day, sometimes three. Uh, people are writing me asking to be on, uh, but it, just, it gives me like some connection because I'm in a town where I don't know anyone. I mean, it's, yeah. a city, it's a city of 18 million, but I don't have any friends here. I don't yeah, have yeah. any. I just found this uh, stray kitten uh, that was nice. near dead, and I've been nursing him back to health, and he's about six weeks old now, and uh, he's my only <sighs> companion. There you go. There you go, I mean, man. It's, it's one of those things. You just got to make the best of whatever situation you're in, Yeah. wherever you are. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Istanbul is, like, under lockdown, or? Yeah, like pretty the, much. Yeah. Pretty much. Monday to Friday, it's pretty open. Uh, we've got grocery stores open. We've got pharmacies open. And then actually yeah. on the weekends, they fully lock down. So uh, oh. we're getting ready for a, a four-day lockdown. They're going to go Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday this week. Um, so I got to get all my groceries and, and my uh, whiskey. Yeah. I'm a single malt whiskey guy, so I got to get my whiskey oh, nice. on Friday. Do you, do you, you drink it straight up then? Straight up, no ice, no mix, no nothing. Scott, Scottish single malt whiskey for the Highlands. <laughs> oh man, you should I'm see. Not, I can't handle that. No, on my Instagram uh, last week, I did uh, I did a whiskey. I do a whiskey Wednesday every Wednesday, and I drink a whiskey and I toast my audience. And I did it last week with my baby kitten on my shoulder. All right. So listen, some, as long as the keep it light. Are open. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I want to get back to you though. So. You graduate Pace University with a bachelor's degree in economics. You now have some general understanding of the world. And then you decide, though, that you want to be a full-time professional actor. So yeah. what does that look like? Like, what are the steps that someone takes to, yeah. move, to move into being a professional actor? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, 
Because I don't. First of all, I would like to say that I had a lot of support from my parents. Sure. So that helped a lot. In fact, like they encouraged me a lot in high school to do plays because, and they encouraged me to pursue acting. I just was too afraid. But then once I got the film, it kind of, you know, I had something tangible that I could kind of um, think from and imagine from, and then kind of project into the future and be like, okay, I can actually do this. Right. So really it was just moving back home, then com uh, commuting to the city and sending myself out on auditions and continually training with my teacher, with my coach. And then you kind of just like find your own way through it and you find people that you can collaborate with started doing some theater here and there, started doing and basically whatever I could get in the beginning because you're just looking for experience. You're just looking for um, people to just know that maybe one day you can collaborate with again and create relationships. So I did a lot of stuff, student films, theater stuff, short films, um, and then just kind of learn about the business by doing it. Yeah. And uh, it's a very, yeah, there's no, like, because I didn't go to school for it, right? So I don't really, I didn't really know the business too well. I didn't know what was what, who's this, who's that. Mm, do I need an agent, a manager? Okay, how do we get one? How do we do this? And then it's also like reconciling the fact that you are the product that you are selling. Yeah. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. Because it's actually, it's it's another, business to me is like another form of storytelling, which is what I had to wrap my head around because business and marketing and selling and pitching, these things did not come very naturally to me and they still don't, but they're skills that I've forced myself to develop, which is why the social media stuff is very interesting because it took me a long time to get on social media okay. because I had a lot of. I don't know, a lot of judgment about it. And my whole experience with social media was seeing people take selfies or take pictures of their food. And it was just like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing that? But then to wrap my head around brand building yeah. and basically <clears throat> putting yourself out there to then create your own form of leverage, to then create your own audience, to then create your own stream of attention to then create your own value to then sell to whomever wants to buy it, whether it's right. a big time producer or it's just your audience that wants yeah. to keep watching you. So it's been, a, it's been like I'm 29 now. So it's been seven years that I've like fully delved into it. And uh, it's been like, if you ask me at 22, where if I, you know, seven years from now, I'd be on social media. I'd be in LA. I'd be like, that's never going to happen because I'm never going to leave New York. Right. I love New York too much. My family's here. My friends are here. Uh, I'm never going to put myself on social media because that's cheap or that's dumb or that's whatever. Yeah. But I'm, I think once you start like, A, once you start losing enough, and B, once you start realizing that you have to get out of your own way, a lot of possibilities can start coming to you. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because um, uh, uh, for me, my path was a little different. I I was a uh, I went to China and I just backpacked around and taught English for a little while, and then I started writing and doing photography. And because my basketball career was no longer suppressing everything else in my life, right? It was like it was like oh my God, I have so many other interests. Yeah. And so I started writing and doing photography. And then I started working for like New York Times, Time, Newsweek, Forbes, Fortune. And I covered China for like 10 years um, as, a, as a journalist and a photographer. And it was you speak amazing. Mandarin? Yeah, yeah, I can speak Mandarin. I lived in Shanghai for 16 years. Oh, I went oh. to Shanghai for a two-week uh, study abroad economics trip. Yeah. Beautiful. It was so much fun. And the food is amazing. The food is amazing. Yeah, Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai is amazing. So, 
So, um, but then when the, when the economic crisis happened in 2008 and 2009 and 2010, it killed off the publishing industry. So I wanted to keep having this life of traveling and meeting new people and telling their stories. So I decided to make television. So at that moment, I decided I also had to become the product for the first time. And I had to be the host and I also produced my own shows. So I then had to start pitching myself and, and yeah. making myself the center of attention. And that was incredibly scary and uh yeah. and and it definitely created a lot of insecurity yeah. and uh and fear and then you just like you said you have to get out of your own way and just bust through yeah you realize like there really are no limits no if you can like i mean i know plans are great and like having expectations it's just natural but like if you can if we can just like stop making so many plans and just kind of, I don't know, not even go with the flow, but just kind of like pursue interests, even if they lead to like a dead end, there's still, there's just so much that you'll learn that you could possibly do. Like, like, like it's just so hard to really fully un understand the capacity at which you can operate just by thinking. Yeah. But when you do things, and you just put yourself out there to do more and do this and that. And you really start to get an understanding of like how broad your spectrum of possibilities really are. Well, every time, every time you take a risk and you put yourself out into the universe, you change the energy. And right. that's either negative or positive, but it's never right. neutral. Right? right. So you're something's going to happen. And, and it's up to you to, to read the cards and, and, and know if it's going to be good or bad or ugly or, or whatever. But yeah. it's, it's never, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's ever nothing. Happens. It's never right. nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I had a great, like my, that acting teacher that I was working with um, throughout the years, he would always tell me like, just go for stuff. Just go for whatever impulses you have, go for them. Whatever instincts you have in the scene, go for them. Because it's just as useful to figure out what doesn't work just as much as it is to figure out what does sure and understanding what doesn't work is i mean it's painful because you have to fail you have to embarrass yourself but you have a solid understanding yeah this is not for me yes this doesn't work for the story that i'm trying to tell okay this does this thing does now let's use that as a launching pad into whatever next happens and so my that's a very interesting place yeah. to work from Definitely. So the biggest risk I took, uh, I rode a motorcycle. So my first TV show, I pitched this, I wrote out this huge proposal. I wanted to produce this show. I wanted to be in it. Uh, my goal was to ride a motorcycle the entire way around China uh, nice. and film it because I had been working for the Western media for so long and everything was just so negative about China. And I was living there and actually quite enjoying it. And I yeah. thought like, I'm going to ride a motorcycle and show people what China really looks like. So yeah. I pitched it to all the big travel brands and no one wanted it and then i just went out and did it on my own and paid for it and uh and it ended up being a bit of a hit so i did and i set a guinness world record for that trip and then nice. i did another one in india where i rode a royal enfield all the way around india oh nice and, yeah and then uh, and then i did one in brazil and now i have another show where i like climb mountains and do all this crazy stuff and each one of these series is i i basically self-funded and produced because no one wanted to be part of it and and now they're kind of all over the world being broadcast in different ways. And that's how I've been able to get to where I am today. You're the and ultimate risk taker. Then. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it's like no one's going to give you a hand at all. Like people right. don't yeah. understand. People don't yeah. understand how terrible the entertainment industry is. Like I've done, yeah. I've done the rounds in Santa Monica. I've done the, yeah. done the rounds in Studio City. Yeah. You know, like it is ruthless, man. Yeah. And um, and I've been lucky that I've been in a position maybe to see more of the industry and how to yeah. produce and how to direct and how to create. Yeah. So I yeah. just went out and did it on my own. But yeah, uh, I but mean, that, yeah, that's exactly why I got media. on social media. Right. That's exactly why I started just like in 2019, just started putting out content on, on Instagram and figuring out how I can, what I could do, how I could do. So it was very... Mm, it was very messy in the beginning and it was very like, I don't know, let's just put something consistently on the daily. Yeah. And then it morphed into like discovering TikTok and then, but it, it was out of the same kind of mentality of like, you just lose 
I, I like I just lost so much so often yeah. and I was seen I'm, I'm seen as this guy that apparently has all this potential and talent but I, all these other people are zooming past me mm-hmm. and it's like well am I gonna be the guy that never wins a championship you know what I mean? Am I going to be that all-star athlete, the most talented guy to have never won a ring? And it was like, uh, no, that's not going to happen. So yeah. we got to figure this thing out. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is not saying yes, sure. not opening doors. So what can we do on our own? And I mean, in today's day and age, like, you know, the solopreneur can – do a lot of things and can have a lot of impact and can have a lot of influence despite having like no following. Yeah. Or very oh, small following. And I think, I think the, the thing that's really important about finding your own path, whether it's feature films, broadcast, you know, theater, whatever is whatever Avenue, social media, whatever Avenue you choose, you have to make sure, you know, you're, you're presenting the most, kind of authentic version of whatever you want your talent to be like because you're you're an actor it's never going to be yourself it's always going to be the character but yeah yeah, but you have to find the avenue that allows you to perform you know to the best of your capabilities yeah and and nowadays there's so many different avenues like for me it was just kind of television because i felt so many people were so inauthentic on tv and so much of television was was scripted and you know false drama and conflict based. And I just wanted to go out and make people happy and show people the world, um, you know, through a, through a generally happy go lucky perspective. And, and that's just, you know, where I went. And I, I think what you're doing on social media is so out there because yeah. you are doing exactly what you want to do. You are scripting every single thing you want. You know, it is pure Raul. It's not, you're not, you don't have a director, you don't have a producer, no. you don't have a writer. Yes, it's very like, raw. Every, it's, no, but it's, 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 it's coming right from the, from the center, right? It's coming right from the source. Yeah. And, and, and like for me personally, like I wake up every morning in Istanbul and I'm like, you know, I feel like I'm on Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. Like here we go yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I pop open Instagram or TikTok and I watch you for, 10 minutes sometimes because you yeah. just got them you just got them lined up back to yeah and, and it and it just the endorphins the laughing it it changes the entire perspective of my day and and oh. if it's doing it for me how many other people are you reaching because we're in a shitty place right now yeah i appreciate yeah. that that's very nice and that's very kind of you to say no worries. that's why i reached out i reached out to yeah. you cold and yeah, i was like yeah. dude i, I, I want to chat i appreciate it Thank but you. you know i guess it's stuff like that that uh yeah, it, it's very motivating, I, I will say. Like, it's hard to get back to everybody that DMs me, comments me, says this and that, messages me. But I see it all. And I, uh, you know, I, I think the best, the best way that I can ever, like, I don't know, show appreciation to other people showing appreciation to me mm-hmm. is to just not stop. Yeah. Like there's no, there's no rest. There's no day off. There's no, like if I'm not physically working, then mentally I'm working or there's always, uh, there's always more. There's always like, it's just, I, there's no, I don't know. Like if you're going to spend time consuming my content and then eventually maybe one day pay harder money to watch me on stage or uh, on a screen or pay a subscription fee to Netflix to consume a Netflix show that I'm in, whatever it is my, it's, it's my obligation to like put my best foot forward. Oh yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Your audience is everything. There's no, so that requires an immense amount of commitment, uh, discipline, self-awareness, but it's to something that I care about. So it comes kind of naturally. It's like, you know, it's just the obsession comes naturally because I'm obsessed about it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not, I don't have to force myself to do it because it's what I'm choosing to do. Nobody pushed me to do it. And, you, and that makes it the best job in the world. Yeah. And it's not a yeah. job when you wake up every yeah. day and you get to be creative. 
Exactly. And it's yeah. it's not like always sunshine and rainbows, but I think it's it's important to like again, this is why I think discipline always wins out. It what I'm learning now is that even if I'm tired, I can still make content. Right. If I'm hungover, I can still make content. If I'm sad, I can still make content. If I'm a- anxious, frustrated, whatever it is that I'm feeling, I can still make content. So I don't need to feel what I think I need to feel in order to make content. And I think that's the important thing about being disciplined is you realize that your feelings don't need to align with your understanding of what your responsibilities are. Yeah. I think that's beautiful, buddy. I got it. Okay. Let's take, let's take this back a little bit. Yeah. You're, you're a young actor and you're doing, you're trying to make as much stuff as you can. You're trying to make as many risks as you can. Did you ever lean towards comedy? Like when did you become so fucking funny? Like, you know, that's like, funny you say that because, 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 you know, like, were you doing dramatic plays? Were you doing, you know, serious work or were you trying to get into comedy right away? Um, no, it's like weird uh, because I'm not <laughs> like in person. I'm not really that funny, but uh, for, for like, like, I'm not the guy with the jokes in like mm. my friend circle. I have other friends that are, that can make people laugh when we're all together. Like my brother, same thing. My brother is like the very funny uh, person in our family. I'm not, but what I, but for the sake of my work, I'm willing to figure it out. So I, you know, it's, yeah, it's hard for me to describe because the work that I like to do or that I, lean into a lot is this stuff like like you see on the office which is very offbeat funny but it's also very dramatic at the same time and it has a lot of heart right and i i think what it really comes down to and this is what i've i think learned over the years by training as an actor is and what we've been talking about authenticity it's it's about embracing you yourself and so I'm a bit of a weird character. I'm just a weird guy. Like the way my mind works, the way I express it or the, the things I say, the things I think about. Um, I talk to myself a lot. Like being that only child kind of a thing. It made for a lot of time to just play pretend. Mm. And I think now I just play pretend more intensely, more seriously. Sometimes it's funny. I mean, it makes me laugh. So I think that's a, the metric that I use. But it's, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard. It's weird for me to call myself a comedian because I don't. I, I'm just an actor. And to okay. me, the best actors are the ones that are most flexible. That yep. have the most, they can do just about anything. So like people like, I mean, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey. I think people like Johnny Depp, Robert Downey Jr. I think there's always a there's a comedic element, but they know how to um, they know how to Get do there. both. They, they 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 go to get drama and comedy go together. So there's never really any bifurcation. They just know what to turn up, what to turn down. What to, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's a weird thing. I don't understand comedy like. A stand-up comedian like I can't write jokes or like somebody who does skits um, or somebody who does improv mm. I think I understand comedy from like a more acting perspective which maybe is a little more behavioral and more like this is the story we're trying to tell so how do I fit into this story as authentically as I can as myself although I'm saying somebody else's words and I'm playing this quote unquote character, what about this guy that I'm playing is inside of me? And then how do I naturally operate with comparison to this guy? And then in order to get more in line with this guy, what do I have to turn up and what do I have to turn down? Okay. Okay. So first of all, you're being incredibly modest. Um, Like on your, on your TikTok videos, and and you know the stuff i see on instagram and things like that 
you might be saying other people's words in some cases, but the physical performance is your own. And, yeah. and, and that is intense to the point yeah. of h- hilarity. You know, you are, you are driving, you are driving the wardrobe. <laughs> you are driving. Yes. I mean, I think, the, yeah, I think that goes back to being a kid, like playing pretend. I, that's yeah. what I would yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, I'm also, my nature is such that like, I don't have like a, a middle ground. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, yeah. Always. I don't have that 60%. Like when I'm, when I dance, when I practice, I sweat a lot. I don't, I don't, to me, there's no other way of working, but you work hard and there's no other way of practicing. You practice intensely yeah. um, because I, my belief is like, if you want to perform here, you have to practice here. If you then want to take your performance here, this does not suffice. And now you have to practice. You always have to practice harder than you perform because right. the performance should be not easier, but it, it, it should be more automatic. And, um, you know, I think if you study great athletes, if you think about athletes, like the amount of hours they've spent in practice is always more than the amount of hours that they spend on court. Like you're a basketball player. So you understand yeah. you play a 60 minute game, right? For four quarters of, 15 minutes just about or we were 48 two, minutes in college we were 220s uh probably so four, 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 four 15s in, in uh, nba right yeah so basically now out of that 40 or 60 you're not playing the whole game usually you're being subbed in and out but you practice hours upon hours for years upon years for a yeah. game that's 40 minutes of which you would maybe play 30 35 whatever so the proportion of practice to performance is always higher with practice than it is performance. Yeah. So that's I, how I, I see everything that I do that I care about. Okay, that's beautiful. I, I liked it earlier when you were kind of describing yourself as a bit of a strange person, you know, because yeah. you talk to yourself and you're always in your own head and you're yeah. always coming up with new ideas and you're seeing yeah. the world in totally different ways. Yeah. And, and I think that's the beautiful part of being a creative. I think that's, that's our job is to be a little yeah. bit off and to not necessarily fit in with all of society because yeah. we we're used to having people watch what we do and judge yeah. us. And that yeah. changes the energy around us and sure. the way we think all the time. For sure. I think yeah. like if I were a doctor, I'd see everything. As, if I was a surgeon, I'd see everything in surgery. If I yeah. were a musician, I'd see everything in music. If I were a mathematician, I'd see everything in number. Like, I think when you're completely involved in the thing that you're doing, it, uh, it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It influences how you see the world. Yeah, I agree. So you and when you really immerse world, yourself in it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. buddy. Um, yeah. So, so your early roles and your early work that you did after university, um, you know, you, you, the, there was no like comedic element that somehow sparked what you're doing now. I'm I'm trying to find a yeah. link to to your early career to the to the yeah. insanity that you're putting into the world. Yeah, today. I think I think it's there. It's there in small bursts. The, yeah. the weirdness and the uniqueness was, or the weirdness was always there. The strange element, the quirky, off kilter stuff was always there. I've always been seen as a bit of a weirdo. It's just a question of my own acceptance and then my own understanding self-awareness and then my own willingness to inject it more and more and more and more and more into the work and not just into the work but how i actually carry myself in the real world right and you're doing that now because you have the freedom to to write your own right day and and choose exactly. what to do and what not to do yeah. and, and it and it's working and, and you're yeah. putting great stuff out into the universe appreciate it so okay so you were not a social media fan up until late 2019 you yeah. kind of never really bought into it you slowly started putting stuff out into the universe uh i'm assuming that at that same time you were still going to castings you were still working pretty regularly or irregularly but you were you're were, you're a professional actor and that was your job yeah how has this lockdown shutdown covid crisis like just changed your whole world i mean it's changed everyone's world but i'm curious to know 
how it's kind of affected you because like I'm assuming like I was in production when this happened and now yeah. my my entire crew and I my editors my post production team everything we're all just sitting on our hands because there's nothing to shoot there's nowhere to go it's too dangerous to do anything you yeah. know you know how is how has this whole thing stopped you from obviously there's no castings there's yeah, no, no production there's no, no. nothing yeah, it's interesting because I had some good momentum, I suppose, in my professional career in like January, Feb. And yeah. um, I think things would have started, the auditions would have gotten a little bigger and bigger. I think bookings would have happened um, because I finally got eligible for um, the union, which is like a big step forward in order to like, actually get cast as an actor and then be seen as an actor. So that was something that was a little difficult to get. And then I finally got it. And then this happened. But to me, it's always like, it's a game of patience. I've been at it for a long time and I've, I've had to deal with a lot of like, sometimes it's just absolutely nothing happening. Yeah. And that's sometimes the worst uh, because you feel very helpless, hopeless. You don't know what to do. You're, you're trying this, this and that. And nothing is actually manifesting in, into any results that can give you some momentum. And then when you feel like you have momentum, it just gets squashed. And because you're never really, you're never really in control because you're at the, uh, you're dependent on somebody else to cast you or to, you know, at least as an actor, you are to yeah. call you in to, to give you a shot. So in a way, like I suppose the COVID stuff has given me more time to have more ownership over my own content and my own brand and my own story. So to me, it's like, again, you got to make the most of the situation. So I've tried to make the most out of this situation with TikTok and, and then Instagram, but yeah, like everything has stopped. There's no castings. I don't think for the rest of the year, honestly, that there's going to be anything done because we're such a people centric uh, industry. We're such a people centric in close quarters industry. And you just can't have that right now. Yeah. You just, yeah. whether it's an audition, a theater space, audience, you just can't have mass amounts of people interacting. So to me, that side of the stuff is completely closed in my opinion. But for me, I've tasted, I've had a taste of ownership of content and that's an, and, and it's gaining some momentum. So that is a very addictive place to be and something you do not, I do not want to let go. So now the game has shifted. The ambition is still the same, but the tactics have shifted from being an employee to now being an owner. Yeah. More or less. So That's now, a powerful, you know, powerful shift. So now when you become an owner, you have to take on more responsibility. Everything falls on you because it's you now. You're the producer, director, whatever you want. You're not just an, an actor for hire. So, so all the TikTok stuff and the ownership of content and creating content, uh, it all falls on one person, me, but I'm always working now. And now I can create my own, whatever, my own attention, my own um, content and, and, and control my brand. I can control, I don't have to wait for somebody to give me the roles so that I can showcase to you what I can actually do. I can just do it on my own by lip syncing to all this stuff. So now you see my comedic stuff. I can do other stuff so you can see the dramatic work. So to me, what the COVID situation has kind of given me an opportunity is, is, is to own, to take more ownership, even more ownership than I did last year or three months ago or four months ago over my own career, which nobody's going to care about more than me. Yeah. That's amazing, buddy. Uh, you did have a dramatic role. I saw you were in uh, on one of your posts. You were doing a couples therapy with a pizza box, and uh, oh, yeah. you, were talk, you were talking about uh, you know who loves who more, and you yeah, were, you yeah, were really, yeah, yeah, you were, yeah. You were, you were, you were get that was that was maybe a less comedic uh, 
yeah. seen, but you, you, you seem quite heartfelt with the pizza. Yeah. Ah, uh, man, pizza. Pizza is my weakness too. You can't, you just can't go wrong. <laughs> you can't go wrong. Um, I think this is incredibly important for people to know uh, that, that number one, our industry is just so such an adventure in every way. Like there is no certainty in anything we do at any time. And we are just constantly putting ourselves out into the world, taking risks, swinging for the fences every time. And the amount of failures that rack yeah. up far outweigh the, the amount of home runs or even singles or yeah. you know, base, baseball terminology. And what you have done is you've totally flipped the coin. And like you said, become an owner of content and a creator of your own content. Yeah. And I think that, you know, whether that lands you the next movie, whether that lands you the next commercial, whether that lands you the next play, it, it doesn't really matter because in your brain, you wake up every day with a totally different perspective on your creative output and what yes. you're doing to the world. And I think yeah. that is the most empowering thing anyone in the creative world can do. Yeah, what I'm realizing is my belief is... Uh, I'm the creator of my life. You're the creator of your life. Yeah. Your audience is going to be the critic of the critics of your life. The critics are going to be the critics of your life. The people of the world are going to be, are, are going to be the critics of our lives, whether they're good or bad or this or that. Critics will always care about results. Creators. I think if they're going to be sustainable for the long run, they have to be completely obsessed with process. Yeah. Great. And I think once a creator can fully invest themselves and in a disciplined way, remind themselves to get back to process, practice, process, practice, then you can at least sustain yourself over 40, 50, 60 years and something is bound to work out. And yeah. even when the results start to come, we can't tie ourselves to results because that's, that's a very dangerous game to play when you start tying yourself to like, okay, this is the Oscar winning role. This is the million dollar contract. This is this what's going to get me this and that. You always have to come back to process. And I think process always wins for creators. Whereas it's very tempting to buy into results, but results, again, all the results are built off of process. So like what I'm doing now, the results of what I'm doing now is really a process that's been built over the course of basically 29 years. Yeah. It's the result of but, decades. And, yeah, and the next 29 years, whatever the results are, as great as they may be, as not so great as they may be, I still have to be obsessed with the same thing that I was obsessed with the first 29 years, which is process and practice. That's it. It's a very hard thing to do, but I think that's how you win in the end. It's process. Okay. process. That's beautiful. Um, uh, so late November, like late 2019, you're now getting on social media. Did someone yeah. say, Hey, you got to get on social media because you're strange. Or did you just be like, I'm going to try this out someday. And you just got yeah. a bunch of likes and you just ran with it. Like, no, what, someone, what told your, me to, what your someone told me to join TikTok. A friend of mine joined, uh, asked, told me to join TikTok because he saw me dance. And like in some posts I dance and he's like, you should be on TikTok. You should put this on TikTok. So that's how I started. That was in October. And then I didn't really take TikTok seriously because I didn't really get it at first, just like anybody else. <laughs> um, and so I, it, was, uh, it wasn't until like December that I finally kind of started to understand how to use it, how to edit stuff on it, how to do what I wanted to do with it. And then I had to get over insecurities of putting myself in front of a camera and like talking and like being some version of myself, my weird self, yeah. putting that out there. Not the uh, self you are right now where you were having yeah, that exactly. conversation. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's, it's again, it's again, pursuing fear. Um, so it wasn't until end of December that I got really serious into it. And then January, it just, I really just every day, just tick tocking, tick tocking. And then now since the lockdown, you've just been going totally insane. Yeah, like every day. I have two accounts. I have one for acting. I have one for, uh, I'm very passionate about financial literacy. So people learning about money and investing and budgeting and money management and taking ownership of that part of their lives. Yeah. So between the two 
pl uh, the two profiles I must make about uh, maybe 27 to 30 pieces of content a day. Unbelievable. So, yeah, I mean, it takes up about six hours of my day, seven hours of my day, but you know, I got nothing else to do right now. So, so this is where, you know, we got about eight or nine minutes left. I wanted to get into this now. What does your day look like under lockdown, under yeah. quarantine with no work? Like what time yeah. do you wake up? How often are you going grocery shopping? Let your fans out there know yeah. what your day looks like. I wake up at 7.30. Okay. Um, I, uh, uh, I make, um, I do, I make my bed. I make oatmeal. Yeah. Good. I, make, I make oatmeal. Then Mom I, will be proud. Yeah. Then I, I journal for a half an hour and then the oatmeal is done. So then I put it in the fridge, go to the bathroom, take a shower, all that stuff, come out by like 830 thirty. 45 then i'll meditate and do some voice exercises for 15 minutes oh that's interesting may i ask how long you've been meditating if we just take a small aside uh i'll I'm meditating maybe like consistently regularly for like maybe the last six seven months okay um the breathing exercises is stuff certain things that my dad has taught me because he's very big in yoga he's very okay. very passionate about it and then I do some other sort of acting vocal exercises. Then, uh, so by that time, it's about like 8.45, almost 9 o'clock. Then I'll go on social media and start responding to DMs and comments and whatnot. Well, uh, by the way, I really like that you've started to do that and actually make the questions and your replies yeah, part, of the, it's, it's part of, of the show. It's a yeah, lot of fun. And those are yeah. some of my favorite moments, actually, is when yeah. you're just being you. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to interact with people that way. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then what? So I'll check that and post on Instagram for both accounts. And then I will have uh, breakfast. And then by like 9.45, I'm TikToking. Wow. And then I, I will stop by about once I hit my numbers. So I have to post like at least 18, 15 to 18 on my acting stuff, about another nine on my um, investment stuff. And then after that, uh, I'll go dance and work out and then take a shower. And then I will have, uh, I'll probably read. And then I will have dinner and then chill out with some Netflix, something on Netflix. Something there just to like unwind and not even think about anything. That's good. That's good. I would like to humbly recommend uh, my Tough Rides India uh, is on uh, and, and China and Brazil are all on Amazon Prime. So if you ever if you have a Prime subscription and you Ooh. want to see me suffer and have I'll a huge beard and what almost it, die, it? Tough, tough Rides tough uh, rides. China, <laughs> Tough Rides India and Tough Rides Brazil. And you can okay. see a little of uh, me suffering in the Amazon jungle or in the traffic of uh of mumbai oh yeah no oh, we've all i've i've been there i know the yeah. traffic but but uh oh yeah i'll definitely check that out that's great and i'll uh and i'll send you a dm of the whiskey thing with my kitten which you might uh which you might oh, yeah. enjoy perhaps yeah. I, I i'd like to try to make you laugh because you've been keeping me yeah. in a cheerful mood for seven weeks in lockdown now so i appreciate it i appreciate that too um, well, look, buddy, is there anything you want to tell your fans? Um, is there anything that we didn't address? Anything that you feel you want to get off your chest before we wrap this up? Um, I got merch. You got merch. Boom. Excellent. What's the website? <laughs> oh, it's uh, on your Instagram. Yeah. If you go on my Instagram, you go to 316 Merchandise, you can uh, check them out. There's more designs coming out of all the other different characters that I play. We're working on this design where all the different characters are in one scene and they're like all interacting with each other. I think that's really funny. And they're, That'd be you know, great. It's very cool. Which is a very fun endeavor. But other than that, um, just like thank you. Thank you for having me here. And then thank you to like all the people that comment, support, like, um, that watch. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 even though I can't get back to everybody, it, I read it all, I see it all, and it, it's very motivating, keeps me on the ball, keeps me focused. 
So you guys are keeping me out of trouble. So I, I very much appreciate that. And uh, in my honest opinion, I believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think, I think more exciting things are to come. And uh, to those of you that have started following me this early on, uh, I appreciate it. But just know that uh, we're, we're going to go places, I think. I think we're going to go. Yeah, I'm very excited about the future. I'm very, very excited. So thank you to the people that have joined me now. And uh, I look forward to entertaining you guys even more uh, in, the, in the coming years. The backside of this crisis that we're all in right now, I think, is going to be much better than where we were when we came For sure. in. For sure. And we got to be, uh, we got to be the better version of ourselves when we exit all of this. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, buddy. Look, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, keep creating, keep Thank owning you. it, keep crushing it. Thank you. You as well. All right, buddy. You take care. Have a great day. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay, friends, that was Raul Rai, and he is just an incredible talent and, uh, and really just a humble human being. You know, I did not know how that call was going to go. I did not know uh, him at all. We had never spoken by phone or by video. I just wrote him and said I would love to have an interview with him and learn about his process and what makes him tick for his tick tock. And, uh, and he's amazing. Um, you know, getting to speak about his acting, getting him to speak about his his early years as wanting to be an actor, his BA in economics and, and learning about, you know, the world through economics. Um, it was just beautiful. So I want to thank uh, Raul and, uh, and hopefully he keeps creating and keeps doing great things. And uh, yeah, and I hope everyone out there stays safe and healthy. And thank you for uh, following another one of my COVID calls. And we'll be back online tomorrow. Check my Instagram stories for times and guests. Thank you, Raul, and thank you, everyone else. Take care. Stay safe.